coordinated by mainly by me, but also by a group called Open Field and which is a group of designers with sustainability. And Green Drinks in general is just a very loose, informal grassroots network of people who self-organize their own events in their own cities. And I think it's about 665 cities around the world. And it started in London in the, in the 80s. So we have been lucky enough to be able to do the Nelson Green Rings here at the Pavilion now for the summer. So all the topics will be something about design and sustainability in some way. And then especially because this so-called maker movement, whatever that means, kind of DIY, people are able to make their own things. There's fab labs spreading and maker spaces. And these kinds of issues, that was also interest of the, of the Pavilion program organizers, Devils Helsinki. That, that could be one theme and it matches my doctoral research. So this maker culture is also one of the themes. So that's why I invited Massimo to come today who is guru of open design. Yes. So Okay. Hi everybody and thanks Cindy for inviting me. Uh, my name is Massimo Menichinelli from Italy. Now I'm living in Helsinki. Uh, I like this very informal setting, so I really would like to keep it in a very informal way. So I will just introduce myself, and everybody should be probably introduce yourself, himself or herself, and then we probably, after a bit of interruption, just to give the framework, we can talk more freely with the questions. Because also there is much more than usually I put in the presentation, so it's also, well on one side it's sometimes it's okay, but sometimes it's gets very boring to have presentations and also take a lot of time to put all the knowledge into this presentation so that codifying the tested knowledge is a very long process so usually most of the interesting things come up with the question so let's start from the question this time <laughs> and then I can point you to the presentation that are online so well my let's start from my background I start study industrial design and also service design and many more kind of design in Italy, in Milan, in Polytechnic Milano. And I finished studying there in 2006, so quite a few years ago. And already with a master degree thesis when I did 2005, 2006, I started addressing open source and peer-to-peer -peer and how to, we can bring them into the design practice. And then after that, basically was still, basically was yet, was impossible to work on this thing, the issues, because we were talking okay about that, bring open source or P2P and design, the, usually the reaction was, are you doing something illegal with this P2P design? Or, so it was very difficult to work with these things. It was also some months before cross-sourcing, articles and books, economics, so it was also very difficult to understand these things and then of course convince people that, okay, this is something that could be interesting for the future, we should start spending a bit of time about that. But that was also a very important experience about understanding you know, the, the impact that you know, every new topic, every new movement also also society. Because even if you're okay, and you understand that it's something very good, uh, it's not good enough until uh, enough people are interested in that. And then of course you see a lot of different social dynamics appearing and different people uh, having a different role and with strange dynamics, but that's important. I mean, in any case, it's like, if you're just doing it at your home, yeah, probably it's very nice, probably it's very interesting, but it doesn't have a huge impact start having a huge impact with other people and many more other people are starting doing that. Then probably it's maybe even more difficult. Sometimes you see strange things happening, but it does then when it starts to be meaningful. Sometimes there is a problem, I would say, in, in the research world to understand these things are emerging. And probably that sometimes there are these topics are addressed only where they already emerged, so with a bit of delay. But in any case, coming back to this, so basically it was impossible to work on this, so I basically say, okay, I will publish everything that I've been doing, my thesis and everything as open source online, and see if it's really a, a good way, a good strategy for having a discussion with other people. So I start studying myself how to code, and creating my website and publishing everything there, and that actually was a very good idea. Well, I also had the great idea to put everything in three languages, Italian, English, and Spanish, which was a very bad idea because I spent a lot of time. <laughs> and now everything is only in English because of that. But it was very good for uh, networking and knowing a lot of people. So that when I started doing workshops and lecturing in 
Italy, Spain, then other countries. So then I went also to Korea, Singapore, uh, Mexico, Germany, and also it was very long list of countries. And then of course it was also Helsinki. So also that's why I'm here now because I was invited as a speaker to a conference about openness here. So in any case, this works really well to sharing everything as open source, to networking with other people and finding other people. And also what happened in these years, it was also before, was really everybody was working it's more or less in its own room or a very small project. And most of the main projects about open design, if you see Instructables, Arduino, or the Repra, for example, started around 2004, 2005. And what happened in, in the first four years, because things started to get really interesting in 2009, that then slowly more networks started to build and then there was kind of ecosystem emerging already in 2009 so that when pe things started to get really interesting but then of course then in a couple of years they have become even more interesting with more people working on this so now okay this is very cool open design right now it's getting trendy when even a few months ago it was really controversial it is still but now there is much more interest but yes it's, this is interesting because really people started to uh, emerge more as a community and as a network. And then of course it's still not clear exactly what is open design. So if I say, okay, let's talk about open design, it could be a very broad topic and we could be really talking about uh, hours and hours. And I will say that anybody talking about open design has his own specific view. That's always, but since it's something that is still evolving, it's very important to understand most of this. So for example, my specific view is when I started to inter be interested in this, is a bit different from say, okay, we just share to the blueprint of an object and the object is open source because it's online. Actually, I didn't even start from open source directly. Well, um, I started basically from few search directions that were at time in Italy, but also in Europe. And the European one was called Spark and actually started in, here in, uh, in Dyke. And it was this, uh, research direction and try to understand how design could be used for improved localities, cities, regions, territories, or local communities. So I started studying that, and of course my question was, okay, we, will, we are going to design for communities, for local communities, we want to help them, improve them with our projects, but how do we get them involved in our project? Because if it's just, okay, we designed the perfect thing for them and we just push it down to them, then probably it's not the best way for solving the local problems if we up to solve local problems. And participation was the key word in all of this, in all of the disciplines that were starting to get interested in openness, or, and also territories was like participation. So my question was, okay, we, have, we want participation, but how do we get this participation? Because it's not something trivial, like, okay, we, we open something and we have participation magically. So it's something that requires, I would say, a lot of attention and energy. It's like when you open a restaurant, if you open it I don't know, in the middle of the forest, you have to build the road to the restaurant, then you have to put signs for getting to the restaurant or the pavilion. You have to advertise it so there is much more around it, not just the, the project itself and the participation. And already at that time, there were some interesting examples of adopting open source as organizational forms in many different uh, fields, biotechnology, software, well, something about hardware, design, uh, doing movies, many other content like journalism and so on, so it was really spreading. And it was really promising for, as a way of organizing communities and getting an active involvement of people in this. So basically what I tried to do is to bring open source and peer-to-peer -peer as dynamics and strategies and processes into design practice for designing this kind of new organization with the community. So at least what I do usually is okay, if I talk with the community and try to understand them, and try to design with them how this open source process will be adopted by them. This is really important because, okay, if you go to a community of hackers, then you can say, okay, we just use the software for developing open source software and it's very cool, but it's very geeky, so why you, you already know how to use them. But if you go to a local community, they've never used, I don't know, even a browser, then you can ask them to, to work with version control system. And some of you already try version control system <laughs> and it's not that simple. I mean, if you really want to do open source in the open source way, so it's very important to start from the community and understand how to build the participation. And what is also important from that, for me, I think it's very important, that basically I am bringing open source into the design process, not to the design result, to the objects, or to the blueprint. So in this way, basically, you can also uh, apply to very different fields. So for example, a few months ago, I basically I did, 
I consulted a group of biomedical researchers because they were developing a software for doing biomedical research and they wanted to transform it from the, from the software, just the software to use to a service and they want to have the user to be involved in the development of this service. So explain to them how to apply open design principles, the, well, the process they call open peer to peer design to this. So in any case it's using okay design but as a process, if you want to call design thinking, but not just that, the chair. And then apply to something that's not normally uh, thought as design, but okay service, but it's also is biomedical research, so it's not something that usually you would think of design. And it was really one of the best moments where they had some lectures or consultancy because they were really interested in understanding this. So there was a lot of discussion. It was really it was almost difficult to talk sometimes because there were <laughs> a lot of questions. So, but it was really nice for them. And I think it's very important also if you work as a master designer that you can apply your skills also to different fields when they might be needed. Not of course to every possible field if it's not needed. But then it gives up much more possibilities. So for me, it's much more about the community around pro a project and also how to make the project sustainable. Because most of the time, uh, people think that open source will be something that you do in your spare time as a volunteer, and then actually, in the end, if you see many open source projects, even in, in software, not just design, there's a lot of money involved. So it doesn't have to be really without money, without uh, remuneration and so on. So it's important to understand also how to make it sustainable, because Usually when they talk about business model for open design, open hardware, there's always somebody saying, yeah, but this is, has to be social, it has to be ethical, so you're bad because you want to make a lot of money. Uh, okay, now I have a contract, but <laughs> I've tried to do this while I was working or almost unemployed or unemployed, so this is not for being incredible rich, you know, on the, on the back of the people. It's, okay, how to be able to have a project that can be run. You need, in any case, a lot of resources. And the biggest, the most complex is the project you need is resources. So when I talk about the design, open design and when I work about it, it's more about building the community, making this, the system and the community possible. That's it. So if you tell me like open design is the chair that you can download or say, okay, we are forgetting a lot of it. Because if you work, I don't know, with open source software, you know open source software, you know most of the time you will be going, I don't know, so sourceforge.net or now on github.com and download the software. And then of course, as a user, what you see is like, okay, go there and I download the files. But that's not the only thing. There's also a lot of going on. There's all the community, all the strategies, all the collaboration and competition as well. And that's actually what makes it possible. So it's okay to, that you see all the facade, but it's like when you go to a restaurant, you don't see only the waiter. You see also, there's also a lot going on after that. So it's also something that's very difficult to communicate and to, to understand, but I think what's very important about that. And then, well, concluding the introduction, <laughs> I'm now doing the doctorate here in the Media Lab in the Alto University, the School of Art, Design and Architecture. And I'm working as a producer for the Fab Lab that we are actually finishing finally to build and we will inaugurate tomorrow. So you're all invited at three o'clock tom tomorrow at Media Factory for the donation of the Fab Lab. And I'm basically also in the Fab Lab, I take more care of the community and the collaboration and activities in the Fab Lab and the machine. Sometimes also set up machines, but then of course my perspective is more about building the community and the activities around it. So then we will be really great to see your in your introduction, and then we, if you have more questions, then we can go deeper in any topics because there are a lot of topics that can be uh, addressed talking about open design. So it also depends on your special interest. Um, may I ask which team was it? It's uh, the project is called Symbioms. Symbioms? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not so large. It's, just well, it's not a university, it's basically a private, it's, uh, private lab. Oh, no. What? It's basically a private lab, lab not a university lab. Oh, yeah, it is a university project. It's yes. between, um, you know, FIM, it's a Finnish Institute of Molecular Bio uh, Medicine. I'm not sure if it's the same. Is it also? It's the same unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not <laughs> a question, but anyway, there was no, no name which I know. Okay. Okay.
<laughs> I remember there were different also university involved also from Greece as well. Yeah, there were, there were so UK. I don't know the names because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm involved there, but I'm a business researcher, so I'm no. building concepts for them no. and uh, business models and this kind of stuff. So I'm not very much into medicine myself or biology. I've been working in systems physiology, so all those things which you have to research on the whole rent. So sleep and pain and brain. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's different. It's mostly genetics what they do. It's been much more interesting in getting input from the users. First participatory design, especially in Northern Europe in the 70s. Then user-centered design, especially started from human-computer interaction. Then, of course, human-computer interaction, and well, especially user-centered design is more like, okay, we do a research about the users, we, have, we then formulate some standard users, personas, and then we start to design for these standard users. But then, of course, after a while, in your research, I understood that Okay, that we can improve this because it's not always that these standard people, standard personas. So then the next step was like, okay, let's try to map the experience of these people. So their user experience in terms of understanding their background, the emotions, the culture, and also what they really feel about the, what the survey, not just having standard people like they're like without feelings, but the people with their feelings. And then of course that was also was a huge step, but it was also not enough. On one side, it's very difficult. You can map all the emotions and the experience of a person. So also one possible solution, like, okay, let's try to bring them exactly into the design process. And that was basically the co-design jump, which is something that has happened in less than 10 years. And it's still very broad and very uh, unexplored landscape. So there's still a lot of discussion about this. So most of the time, uh, the searchers tend to agree that it's more than the uh, a method or a technique is more a philosophy. Still, it's not clear as a specific field. And then in any case, most of the co-design only happens with specific workshop or over a limited time and space set. What could be about open design, and of course, it doesn't replace completely because it's very useful if you don't have a lot of time to start with personas. It's very useful to start with mapping the experience of the users or co-designing workshops. But what can happen is that you can have uh, real participation in all the processes then this doesn't mean that by it's automatic that you have everybody working at the same time with the same intensity, with the same uh, knowledge and so on. But it can give you much more uh, opportunity for having much more participation, building on top of the previous, the previous one. So if you want this co-design but applying other te techniques to co-design. So generally it's also at the same, at the same moment it's still something that has to be defined clearly as co-design and, and it's also part of that. Now for me, this, uh, the difference between open design and core design is that core design is just, like as you said, it can be just one workshop. Yeah, open design is about sustainability. Yeah. So that uh, you have the service blueprints somewhere and they can be reused. Yeah. But core design, it can be like, I don't know, I went to my mom and asked how she likes the make coffee or I don't know. Yeah. You know, that's, that's very particular. It's just a name of technique. But Open design is to making it actually work and in the long run and be sustainable. Yeah, because core design and I'm sure it, it happened quite a, a lot before also. It's, it just uh, was maybe more popular in the last ten years. But of course it happened. Yeah, in one way or another. It's just like like a normal human process. Yeah, but uh, to make it actually work. Because, for example, with the, the workshop that Master was talking about, that he basically had some 
like some forms, ready-made forms that he created and some different projects. And then he brought them there and said, hey, you can uh, use this in your project to make it better. Yeah. So it wasn't just, hey guys, you should ask your users what they want. Yeah, yeah. He actually gave some tools that were from some other maybe areas, yeah. different projects. And that's, uh, that's very important difference because if you say user centric and uh, have one project of two years when you include users and then uh, the project is ended and uh, everything is uh, maybe forgotten or maybe not. But yeah, well, it's difficult to judge because there's very longitudinal user centered co design projects that have gone on for actually 10 years in real estate, mm. for example, and uh, renovations. In, in so yeah, well, that. And like yeah. healthcare, those are becoming a longitudinal project as well. So I think it's, I think it, but there is something there that often the designers involved in co design projects don't see it necessarily that they also want to deliver tools for those stakeholders to be able to keep carrying on with the process. Mm. That is also happening. There's some agencies in the UK that are actually developing toolkits mm. to be able to give to their stakeholders so that they will be able to continue to co design with their users. But exactly. I think this this is more still self organizing. Well, is it also what I'm doing with the field of design at the end of the process? The community should be able to keep organizing yeah. and working autonomously. Yeah. And when sometimes you can have a designer or you can ask for a designer, but the idea that also you build empowerment in the people, not just okay, we we'll make you dependent on us and then we can make, yeah. you know, that, that's also the main idea of building real, a real this community. Is Everything, but it also very, it's a very important cultural dimension inside that. And of course, that comes from the software, and then because it comes from the academia of hacking and of open source software or sharing, that is very important. And I think that it's not just a technique open design. I mean, you can apply it, but there is also a culture behind that. And then, of course, you can try to modify it, adopt it sometimes, but you really have to understand that. Then, for example, a lot of people try to talk about, okay, you know, you know, in a country, in a, in a small town in Africa, people are sharing, you know, how to build a hut, so they're doing open design. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's open design because they, you know, they don't, they don't have the same culture behind that. Yeah. They yeah. do do because they have the same thing about open source and so on. Because otherwise, you will say that you know everything people are being shared is open design, so it has always been open design. And also the same thing is happening about makers, for example. Uh, let's also talk about makers. Okay, so then that comes from the USA, and it's more about DIY people building a project, and usually there's a huge component of using open source hardware and software, and also this dynamics, even if it's not necessarily completely open source. But there is a very geek part of, which is very important. And in the end, I'll say that it really got momentum, especially because of Make Magazine. So it's just important to understand the role of the media in this, in this yeah. part. So it was really a specific hub in polarizing the attention around this. So that why you have Maker Fair and you also Maker Fair in Africa. Uh, so, but it's very important that the way this, also this term has been spread is because of this magazine. Because if you try to translate makers in other languages, sometimes it's really uh, lost its sense because it's not like, okay, somebody was doing anything. Yeah. then really everybody is a maker. So I think it's really important to understand, okay, where it's starting from. Because, of course, there is a lot of discussion and some people say, yeah, okay, even, you know, artisans and people working with Rafa have always been doing makers, been making, so we also be, we already, you know, the country of makers because we were doing it for centuries and centuries. And the result of it would say that, okay, so then we are already all makers, so why should we care about this? It doesn't exist. So in any case, I mean, you're adopting something that has some specific origin, some specific value. It's not like, okay, yeah, we just generally, general sharing. So that's something also important to to understand a bit when you're adopting this. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm still not clear about the connection between the culture and the uh, design and the design and the design. As you said, that if someone is doing like sharing some designs in Africa, it's, it's not even seen. It's just because uh, someone who developed an open design decided that it's uh, easier. It's just easier.
easier way to describe it if you're connected to culture? Or like what is why is it connected? If you say for example you know, everything has been designed before or you know the first laws about copyright in the seventeenth centuries, then I can I can I wouldn't say, you know, that in the, in in the 13th century, you know, people were doing open design because where they were showing among themselves how to build things. Is it about the standard then? How you show it? Or is it about that, uh, okay, like for example, open source, there is a the list of things what should be, what can be called open source. So it's a uh, code, it should be shared in a particular manner, it should have like license attributed to it, like these kind of licenses. So isn't it the same for open source? Also, I would say that it's also important to really... If you talk to people that work with open source software, it's not really the same. I mean, okay, the idea of sharing could be, okay, we all share, but share in a different way with different also philosophy around that. So if you talk with people that work with open source software, a lot of times there is a huge discussion about which specific license you use. Because each license has some also philosophy, so it's not just okay, I'm sharing this. Because you could be sharing in a way that, you know, implies different dynamics. Uh, it could probably force other people to share on top of that, they usually the GPL, the virality of a license that mm. you know, force you to share back what you're being taken. Yeah. There are other licenses that do that, this, and this is not just you know, the strict legal uh, part. If you go to a many hackers meeting, most of the time the discussion is not just, okay, I need to write this lines of code, it's like around the philosophy of that. So for you, it's like open source as well as open design is much more about philosophy than about actual sharing of some uh, artifact? Not more, but it's important to have a role like stories. So this side is very important. Because I would say there are a lot of now services emerging where basically they let you download the file of an object and 3D print. And then some, you could say, okay, it, I can download it and modify it, but it's, it's open source, but it's not actually in the same way people are working open source software. Because it's not something that is completely neutral that you're just taking like, okay, this is a hammer, it's completely neutral, so I can use for whatever. There's a lot of values embedded in that. So does, does it need the closed system very strongly so that there's some kind of opposition there? But there isn't too much of this closed consumerist culture in the African village. You know, they have been kind of sharing their knowledge just because they need to for so long. So there isn't that contrast. Well, in some, th in some levels, I mean, now we talk more about openness because, of course, there is a huge con contradiction, contraposition with problem of proprietary way of, wor of working. But it's not necessary to be really against that. I don't think that yeah. it should be really okay. I, I don't use this because it's not open. Yeah. Uh, There's also one problem I will say in open, many open source projects that tend to reinvent the wheel, like, okay, you know, this music player that I would like to use, this is not open source, so I will try to redesign it again, but make it, make it open. And sometimes probably they should be focusing more on the quality of the project and then just making another, another music player. Because there are many, many music players for Linux, but still a lot of things lacking for making it real, I think for many people. So I've been using it for Linux for years, so it's not a problem for me, but I know that for many users, it's still like, okay, we need more understanding of the users, not just the, the software to make it completely open. Because most of the time, the end users, it's not a lot interested about, of course. This is open because it's, yeah. we are sharing and there is this ethics around that and this philosophy. So this is also a pretty critical point. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a little bit disagreeing because um, uh, I think that uh, all this, like you were talking about Africa, but the whole developing countries, they have uh, much more incentive to do open things and they are much more like in this culture already not because they created like some ethics in the society and they said hey this is cool I, we will all go echo but because they are basically forced to do that because uh, I'm, I mean for example I was uh, reading some reports about uh, well I'm originally from Russia you know, USSR is born, and uh, for example recycling rates in USSR were very very high just because people didn't have anything. They had to recycle. I remember we were keeping all the plastic bags, they were reused millions of times. Like all the bottles were collected by uh, someone who needed to earn like, some uh, drinkers or just very poor people. Right? Like it, it was, the rates were extremely, extremely high. And uh, that's, 
I would say that's a very natural way to do this peer-to-peer -peer designs and sharing. And also, like I remember, very many funny kind of devices that were like made out of some unsuitable details first, you think, but then it works, and then people would share in them also with the others. So, like, I, I would, I would call it also some kind of origins of open design. I don't know, of course, that. There might be a problem with the standard because, of course, if you can only share it with your neighbor, it's a little bit uh, uh, not enough for spreading around. But uh, what you were talking about, the culture, I think there in these developing countries, the culture of innovation is like the most pure because it's just because they have to do it, not because they think they should do it, but because that's uh, that's the means to survive. And in well, in Africa, for sure. Because I also was uh, listening to some um, workshops of, uh, about innovation in, uh, in developing countries, in uh, India and Africa, and there's like they're doing amazing things there, and with much less money than we imagine here in the West, we should spend on innovation. And much, and I think that that aspect should, like, if you cross it out from the field of open design, I'm not sure. Maybe you're talking about like more academically, I, or maybe I didn't understand very well, but. Uh, I, I really have problem excluding it from uh, from the area. No, not excluding in the sense like I mean, what well, is very important that it applies, it's cool, but it's not just because you're sharing. I mean, of course, say in Africa is isn't saying anything because it's a huge universe. Mm. So it depends. I mean, I would say if you do it's just go really in a small town or in a small village and so on, uh, because you cannot call. You know, for us it's very understandable. It's a good way for understanding. Okay, they're sharing, so it's open. But it doesn't mean okay. The, you know, the history has always been about open source because it's something that started, you know, in 1995, mm. for one reason because somebody else could tell you, no, this is free, free software or free design. Mm. So how do you do with that? I mean, somebody could tell you, no, in Africa they're doing free design, and then of course in Africa they'll tell you, no, we are doing something else. Mm. I remember when I did a workshop in uh, in Seoul, for example, mm. one day we invited one of the persons who was creating Commons Korea and explained Creative Commons, yeah. and all the Korean students were really happy, like, oh, I like this system. It's very good. And there were some Chinese students and say, what is this? What is this terrible thing? I mean, it's useless. We don't need this. In China, we copy everything. We don't need permission. Actually, you know, sometimes you can forbid us to, to copy with this because if you put non-derivatives option then. So, of course, you, if you go there and you talk about, yeah, oh, you're doing open design because you're sharing with your neighbor. I mean, it's a very yeah, different yeah, thing. I mean, this started in the United States yeah. especially. And I mean, you can adopt it. You can bring it, but it's not like the same. Uh, yeah, I understand that. So if they want to, like, yeah, they want to share maybe with someone, but not with everyone, and then it's like it's different from the culture of open design when you actually have to share it to the universe. But I think that's a that's a small issue, and those uh, regions are, have a still very great potential to be good. Absolutely. And that's that might be like some uh, separate stream or topic, but it's uh, I think it's very very important because uh, I was. Uh, it, it was very interesting about this uh, innovation in developing countries because uh, they were given examples how uh, some American uh, charity companies are coming there and building, uh, for example, water towers for uh, finding water. Because there is no spare de uh, spare details, no one knows how to fix them. So, like, it's not really a suitable solution if you don't like take into consideration like every like, all the people there is like, do they have specialists? So, if, if it got broken, then they have to ask someone from US to come and fix it. And then it's uh, it's, it's it's very stupid, basically. And then there are some local people who are trying to do some also some refinement solution. And there's there was a picture that uh, there was uh, some I don't know I don't remember what kind of device it was, but it was on the bicycle. So when uh, someone was uh, riding a bicycle, the water was going from wine uh, from uh, one bottle to another, and it was somehow refined. So these kind of things, and they would be like they for this money they could buy like millions of these bikes and, and do something else about it. There are a lot of, well, for example, in open source software, there are a lot of projects in ma many developing countries. Mm -hmm. So in any case, there probably will be one of really the good 
places where you could adopt these strategies. Mm. The only thing is I'm warning is like, okay, think also about the history because we are talking about open design now because there was open source software in the 90s and we software before, not because it had always been open source design and then we, we changed the name. Mm. If you see, for example, what is patented after 20, is patenting is basically a compromise with the government. You say, okay, I'm getting the right to manufacture this for 20 years, usually. Mm -hmm. And then after that is public domain. So it's not even you know, Creative Commons, it's not even it's public domain, it's completely open, free for everybody. But that means that, okay, that everything that's been patented before now is public domain, but it's not the same thing of open design as the context. Just understanding the bit, the, the pieces, because not generally everything that you share is, is, is open. Okay. And also open, as well as the history of K, it re, it's a contraposition with something that's closed and also something that you can access and you can modify and it's different from the, the result. Usually it's the source code that you can modify and the binary code that you cannot modify because it's only the machine can understand that. So that's why there is only, only about, about that. Because and also at the beginning when I started the project, it was like, oh, okay, you know, when they form the Grameen banks form the groups into the small village, it's like they go there, they go directly with the people, and then they basically have these groups, they have peer-to-peer -peer dynamics because they don't have any intermediation. It's okay for understanding like, okay, this is peer-to-peer -peer for us, but then if you probably go to the village in India and, and ask you, in Bangladesh, sorry for the mean, then it's just key. Are you doing peer-to-peer? -peer? It's like, yeah, that's no. Exactly, it's exactly, that was exactly my point actually with this P2P, and that's what I learned from your workshop also, is, is the culture and the protocol is actually how to make self-organizing systems work mm. so that they are like sustainable in that they are able to gen regenerate themselves and continue to exist and all that kind of thing. Because I have worked in so many NGOs and self-organizing projects where we didn't have strategies. We were just a bunch of passionate people who came together and, you know, it was kind of a big mess and, you know, we would try to self-organize and sometimes we were successful and a lot of times we weren't. But if we had known, you know, like Mossimo's toolkit and all of that kind of thing, then we actually have strategies for moving forward to be consciously open and self-organizing, rather than just being the African village who's forced to share because they have to, that kind of thing. There's, I think that there's this little different level of being, of the culture of being self-conscious about your peer-to-peer -peer organizing. I think you had a question. Uh, no, I just uh, remember this, um, I wanted to ask if that could be called open design. There was this uh, commercial of Pepsi. About Pepsi. Uh, they made it like they found this guy in uh, somewhere in Asia who in, in, invented this thing when you feel uh, oh, yeah. water and you put and it you in feel the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and you put it in the roof uh, and then it, it can work like a lamp. So it's it's really cheap <laughs> way to, to solve this problem of not having electricity. Uh, and then it kind of just exploded because of this Pepsi commercial because somehow the company found this idea this guy who put this Pepsi bottle in his roof and then everyone saw it due to and also learned Yeah, that's a very difficult <laughs> you know, uh, case because probably really it has been done without that real uh, uh, idea of okay, I want to share this with everybody. That probably locally, yes, you share with other people in the village and so on. But then, of course, it's been taken by some other dynamics and, and media. So that's also well. Probably, I mean, we can call it like it's open design, but if we really go there, probably there is no uh, definition or discussion about that. That's one very good example of what, when you really need to share this thing because it was really clever, it was really low cost, cheap, uh, low tech. So it was really a good thing that should really be shared because it was really a lot of application in different places. So that was really good. So in, in any case, I mean, there is a way that you work in this system, network system with coordination among the people or by just with no coordination by you know, randomly or with emergent properties and emergent dynamics. Uh, learning that. 
It was very interesting uh, software that was developed by some researchers at the University of Washington. They were taking, for example, uh, all the pictures from Flickr, from the Flickr API, and they were looking, for example, I don't know, pictures of the Colosseum in Rome, and they were basically able to understand from the GPS position of the camera and the setting of the camera where they were, the pictures were taken, and they were able to reconstruct in 3D the Colosseum from the pictures. So this is not coordinated. You know, there is no coordination, but just, people are not cl collaborating. Okay, I'm putting everything online, but if I put this here, it's not like I'm you know, purposefully collaborating with you or talking with you. But then that was possible because of this network system to build something from that. That's also something very interesting to see how it could be uh, taken. Probably will say it's not really how at least all these open things generated, but that could be, or it's something very interesting to, to address. <laughs> well, I started with two examples, so they're already very old, and in some cases they are still probably the best than many other pro uh, projects. And the first one was done in '99 at MIT by some PhD students. They basically, okay, it was a course for other students, so basically the students had to design something for local communities in third world, usually it was Africa or probably some South America, some countries. It was on, okay, an object that should uh, solve some specific problem. And then designed an pl online platform for having this uh, open design work process. It was really, probably for me, it was the f really first open design example. But what was really good, it wasn't that it was just, okay, we have the platform online and we share, but they actually build the connections with the local communities, NGO, in those countries. So say, we know that this community needs something, and it is specific, and then, okay, we can develop and then we can test. Uh, this thing with them. So one of the projects that they did, for example, was a very simple and very low-cost device of three things called error. So it was a medical device, it was very simple, and there was something was needed in that place. And they discovered it through the NGO and through the local communities, and then also the, they did the prototype and developed it further with, the, with an hospital. So what was very interesting is not just, okay, I designed this, it's online, it's shared, it's open, it's for you. But find a way to make it really meaningful for communities and having more people involved. Mm -hmm. Even I don't know, an hospital, you say that you will sort of say why they should care. Well, probably yes, because it's open. So that was really good also on building the, the community and the system around that. And the other example, which is not really open, but it's peer to peer, comes from the UK. It was this unit from the Design Council called Red Unit. To then, well, Stop it, ended after a few years, and now most of the people work in a design agency that is called Participle in the UK, and they're bringing the same experience over there. And basically, they started to say, okay, we should bring these open things with collaboration in design. But the project that they did weren't open source, even if they had the same more or less philosophy. But what they tried to do to have a real active involvement of the uh, citizens in public services. So, for example, one very good example it was a project called Open Health. They are two different cities, Kent and Bolton, and they wanted to do two different uh, issues. In one city, it was the diabetes, and the other city was the problem that it seems probably counterintuitive, but if you do more uh, exercise, physical exercise, then your health is better, and then you get less disease. If you don't smoke, you get less disease, and in the end, when you sum all the citizens, you know, in a country, there's a huge saving in money and less problems. You don't need a lot of many uh, doctors working on that disease, health, uh, um, heart disease, for example. And they understood, okay, you know, citizens don't want to do, you know, a lot of health uh, exercise. And then they they don't want to do because they are alone, like, oh, why should they run alone? So they find a way to basically uh, make people active in finding together, finding each other and work together and use this exercise together and, you know, be motivated and do that. So it's really peer-to-peer. So it's a part of co-creating of the public service on a peer-to-peer level, more than open source. And in the other city, when it was talking about the beat, they understood, okay, uh, a lot of things going on in curing diseases is you know, self-support between people with the same disease. You know, okay, I have this, you have this, okay, how can I cope with this? So they're trying to implement this in a more, uh, not formal, but uh, and not official, but really easier f a way to find it. So if I go to an hospital, I get I have the disease that will already, already put me in contact with people with that, the other disease. And the service is built in a way that we can help each other in that sense. So probably, yes, what we're sharing is also open. Uh, the service itself wasn't shared completely as open source because it was tested and, okay, it ends or 
sometimes it goes on, but the, the idea was really good. It was really good. So, and I think they are still the best one. Then, of course, there are many other projects that they sometimes they go more towards hardware, sometimes more design, and they were really good also historically. But this is in a way for really having active involvement of people, that this were among the best. And then if you go more in hardware, because design is less developed than you see, open hardware. It's still a bit behind. And then what I think is really important to see that in open design is not just about physical things, because design is not just about physical things. So you, so you have people that have been shared, I don't know, typo typography. They have been saying, of course, graphic design as well. And many more things, uh, video games, some people call it, you know, game design, <laughs> movies, some people call it movie design. So it goes to many different also ways of working. But it's still a bit less developed than hardware. Another will say that most interesting ones are two. One is the Arduino, and the other one is probably the RepRap. Arduino is basically it's very simple um, microcontroller board, so it's like a very small computer, but uh, it really helps you in prototyping interactive objects. And it's not just the hardware, but it's also the software and the services. So it's very easy to use. So if you want to create hardware on your own, and I've been doing that, then you really need a lot of knowledge. But if you use this, it really helps you do a lot, do a lot of things without studying too much. And it's so useful that it's been you know, modifying a different version. So there is a version that you can use on your clothes, so you can also wash it. There are many, many different versions. So one way probably you will see, you measure the success of an open project, is how many people have copied and modified it. And you see that that's really huge in Arduino, for example. And then it's really also very good for lowering the barriers to people to use this. So now if you want to create, I don't know, an object that, that sends the environmental data for the pollution in the air and put it as open data on the web, you can do very quickly with Arduino. You just take a sensor, you have one cable to the Arduino, the Arduino is attached to the computer, the software is very simple and put everything online. Before that, you really have to, st have to study electric, uh, electronic engineering and so Maybe you could tell us a little bit about Arduino. If there's somebody who doesn't know what Arduino is, well, it, it's an interesting story about that list because for me it's from Italy, but it's also because it comes from a small city where before there was a huge company, uh, Olivetti, that did the first computers and typewriter, and then unfortunately collapsed. So in any case, the local uh, territory still kept a lot of knowledge and expertise about working with electronics. So they had this uh, very interesting, very nice interaction design in the school for four years or something, where a lot of people from other countries also arrived. So there were more foreign students than Italian students, actually. And after also they also closed it. And meanwhile, they developed this board. It was really useful for people working in interaction design because it was cheaper, much easier to, to produce. And actually, it's, it, okay, it's open source, and there are also some versions that you can actually build yourself in a fab lab. I also did that. So it's not that difficult. And it works completely in the same way. So it's also really helped you a lot. Then the, the school was closed, the university was closed, so the good way that is, okay, let's put everything as open source. So it survived a lot. So the school dead, died, but then this is got really huge. But I think that was really important that you see that it was being modified and also copied and integrated by many, many other uh, initiatives. And the same is happening with the RepRap. The RepRap started in the University of Bath in 2004, and it's a 3D printer. Okay, but 3D printers are, have been around since the 80s, so it's not like, okay, the first 3D printer. But what was really good that they say, okay, we want to show that with this 3D printer we are able to produce another 3D printer. So the machine is able to replicate itself. So they had this very nice uh, biological metaphor. So the first model was called Darwin, the second one Mendel, and I don't know mm -hmm. which is going to be the next one. Uh, and then, of course, well, it was able to reproduce part of the components, not all of the components. So the components are printed in plastic, can be printed by the same machine, but not the components are in metal. But it's improving. And it was an academic project, so if you want to build that, especially the first model, it's very difficult, it will take you a lot of time, because it wasn't designed with the idea, okay, users will use it. It's just okay, we are a researcher, we want to show with a paper that it's able to have a machine that it produces itself. And it was released as open source. And what happened with that, that then a lot of people started to modify it, to make it much easier to produce, much easier to use, much easier to build. So then if you see, there is a graph of the evolution of this machine, that there is a very huge uh, 
uh, evolutionary graph for how many projects started from that. And also the same thing if you look at the evolution of Linux, from one small project, many, many more different projects started. And now basically started from this RepRap, you can find open source machines that are very easy to build and you can use at home and they're very cheap, like around 1,000 euro. And also some of them they also use Arduino. So there's also a lot of contamination between different projects. But this has been interesting not just because you know it was okay, able to replicate itself, but and not just because open but it really generate an ecosystem of people working on that. So now it's really possible for you with just one thousand euro to build objects in your home. And I remember one of the first problems that was when we were talking about open design <laughs> many years ago. It was like, okay, how I have this, you know, the digital blueprints, we are working together or something physical, but then how do we transform it into something physical? Because it's the, just the digital blueprint. It's easy to work in a digital blueprint together, collaborating, you know, especially online or network system. And then how do you transform it? Sometimes, yes, I can work with hand, but it's not that, that translation is not very easy. And for many people, especially for the AY, you know, this, w these machines were like, okay, oh, now I can really do that. We can really work together with that. So. So, for example, it is a very interesting company starting in the United States, which is called the MakerBot. They have an open source uh, printer. And actually, one of the professors behind the rapper also founded them for build this uh, machine and becoming also a company. So, it would have been competition for, him, for his machine, you know. But it also helped them financially to build this machine. And now it's very huge. And one year ago, they got $10 million from venture capital to expand. So, and they are hackers. They started in a hacker space. So, that's what... MakerBot, and this basically was also the really the first one was like okay this is for users. Started by hackers, but really with ten million dollars from venture capital, you cannot say yeah there is no no money involved. No, no, actually there is, and especially when we work with physical things, you need them for the logistics, the materials, and so on. So you cannot avoid them. If you work with software, yeah okay you can work in the spare time, but not with physical things or more complex things. Even if it's a service, like you cannot do on your own. I can build a Linux system on my own and compile it. Well, I'm not that good at coding, but it's possible for a person to do that, but not with other things, especially more complex, which usually is design. And then also other uh, 3D printers started from this MakerBot. And then they also did something else. They create a website, Thingiverse, where you can upload your files for 3D printing online, and you can use Creative Commons license, or if you want, it is one of the best places for finding open design. There is less thought and work about building collaboration between the people. It, it happens, emerging, it emerges. It's more randomly like, okay, I like this, I will modify that. Because that's the way the platform is built. Because also what I was wanted to talk about, you know, the culture beyond it is like, you know, especially all these tools for collaborators, they're not really natural that, okay, they enable collaboration. But which kind of dynamics? I mean, the dynamics that enable are really depends on the developer wanted to enable these dynamics. So they have some values and better. So the way that you work with these tools, it really depends on the way the tools has been designed. It's not that, you know, it's uh, any possible collaboration model. They really enable different dynamics. So what you do there is mostly upload and then something from somebody else. It's, it's not the same as you will see when people develop open source software, which is much more integration of the discussion and working together. But it's a very good place where you can download a lot of things and you then can 3D print at all. And that's very interesting. Okay, they start, okay, we are, can we do this? But then they also start producing their own design, the very nice design, because as a user, if you buy this 3D printer, okay, then what do you, what do you print? If you're good at designing, you design something, you print it, but then you need something nice that you know, motivates you to, to buy this. So also, giving the content as open, you know, it's a way for them to probably more use it. Uh, buying the machine. And this is the same strategy that proprietary companies are adopting for the 3D printers. You buy the 3D printers, it's, okay, it's cheap, it's nice, but then they are already a package of the uh, content that you can download for free. Uh, 3D System, which is probably the biggest player in the 3D uh, printing uh, market, because they started from the 80s, so they're really like the innovators of uh, inventing new technology like sterolithography. Then they, one year ago, they bought Freedom of Creation, which is a design company. The founder is Finnish, but the company is, uh, is Dutch because he moved to Netherlands to start it. And then they announced, okay, 3D system bought us, and then we will release everything as open design. Why so? Because if you want to buy a 3D system uh, printer, then you have very nice content that you can print. Because if you buy, okay, then what do they do with 3D printer? 
So there is also this thing, I mean, there is also the risk if you want sometimes that open design may be also just used as a way for selling that, this technology. So why is this also important to understand uh, how things work in, in the business side for this and what it actually generates because it's not just about uh, releasing you know, the source code, the file as blueprint. I think it's more important to work uh, on building a community. It's a very important research from the uh, United States, it's Eric Von Ippel, he started really in the early 70s, but at least 80, about studying Eric Von Hippel. You can find all his book online as open source because he believes on that, so his homepage, all his books are under open source. And he studied how a lot of innovation are started not by companies but the users, and he called these lead users. So the skateboard, windsurf, and a lot of other things, mountain bike have been developed not by companies but users. The sport enthusiasts that they developed these new products. And then of course companies started or companies adopted this, but they started by users. And then, of course, he has been developed even more these researches. And a couple of years ago, he did a research in UK. And then he also did that in USA and in Japan. He found similar percentage, and they try to expand because usually with lead users, you find some specific niche group, and then you see, okay, how do you develop this innovation? And then try to expand more to, let's say, more or less the whole country. And then, if I like 6.2 percent of the UK citizens, they actually modify product at home. So, like. If you compare, it's like 3 million of people, like they, they buy something and at home they modify it, they hack it, so they're hackers. Not all of them they share, most of them they are retired, so they're, they're not people that know about open source, open design probably, but they're already doing that, and they're not really coordinated, so yeah, there's a huge... Yeah. I mean, well, Africa was just for example, but yeah, it's yeah. happening everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And then we calculate, okay, if it's 6.2% and the amount of things they're doing, it's like, okay, you know, for doing the same amount of work on products, you will have to spend like 2.3 times what actually the, the company in the UK already uh, spending for research and development. So there is a huge amount of people already working on that. So I think there is much more interest and value in really building connection with these people than just, okay, I'm putting the blueprint of the chair online. Because when you do these kind of things, the only things that you're doing is you're making it um, even more a commodity. And then, of course, this is very interesting because also, in any case, this is in some ways already happening. That design is becoming slowly, slowly more a commodity. With you know, cheap production in China, we, we don't know how long it will last, but also with the key and also this mass production is becoming much more a commodity. So you don't get a lot of money by selling the chair or the design of the chair. But the same thing is happening in, uh, in the software. And it's very nice to see the story. So at the beginning, the first computer were the big, huge mainframe that were big as a, as a room or two rooms. And then, of course, you paid for the hardware and the software was for free. Because in any case, you have to really pay like probably also a million of dollars at that time or thousands of dollars for this huge mainframe. So why, why should we charge you also for the software? The software is like it's complementary. Then the computer become more and more, more and more smaller up to the point to become personal computer. And when this, the market of personal computer started, and then that's where the proprietary software starts, because they're like, hey, we could make even a, a lot of money, because a lot of people are buying the, the hardware. So we could charge for them, and then we can get a lot of money, because it's not just, okay, we're selling this huge computer to five universities in the USA. So at that moment, and basically, that where the proprietary software started, and the discussion with free software started, it was the beginning of the, of the 80s. And so also that time, basically, that just the way this thing of free software before open, the open source uh, started, but also slowly the, the software was becoming even more and more a commodity. Because you can also make economy of scale and get less money from that. And in any way, in any case, if you want to see it, the way you also develop free software open source is a way like saying, okay, software is becoming a commodity, uh, let's build services around that, and offer services around that. So, okay, where is the value? Not in the software itself already a commodity, so it's more in interacting with the people and service services, which is the mainly the business model for open source software. There are other more, but then I will talk for too, my, too much time. But that was the main thing. And if you want, probably it's a good way to think, okay, if design is becoming a commodity, what shall we do? I mean, probably we'll say, okay, let's build more things about around the community and the system, which is something that still is not a commodity. So it's also something in interesting to understand. It's like, okay, if you just push thing online, okay, will be become even more a commodity, but you're not finding the value in other, in other things. So that's why also another thing I will say, just to the act of just publishing files online.
already talking for too much time now for other questions. Tractables was in 2005, yeah. which is probably one of the first very big open design community. Uh, the way it works is that you just share the history of building, the story of building an object, whatever it is. So it's like storytelling of building an object. So it's a different way of documenting, but it could be seen also one of the first cases on that. Well, I, I don't know. I've seen when I was doing things, I was, it was easier to have events that are on these topics to collaborate and find it with people that like, okay I've seen your projects online and now we can work together yeah. so it's just by experiencing it yeah. and most of the things then appeared in 2010 usually the the milestone like for example the makers book by Cory Doctorow yeah. because while well, it's a science fiction novel which is at the catacomb so at the same time it's open source and it talks about communities that modify well in this case exhibition and they 3d print them then of course the work uh, and they clash with big corporation in, in the specific case Walt Disney about content and IP and so the business does a huge size on that but if you think about what well, Cory Doctor is also an activist but it's also quite popular so when you have some popular writer that also write about this it's like okay this is not underground any longer it's, this is not an hypothesis there is it's already in you know in the collective imagination then there were a lot of exhibition it was the technocraft and by are in the United States so when you have that this cool star designer that they have an exhibition about hacking and open source in design and there's also another sign yeah. it was very good for example the open design now book that was uh, yeah. published one year ago yeah. mm, mostly because they also there were three organizations behind the book one was bug society which is a foundation they do a lot, a lot of work they also have fab lab they do work in digital technologies it was also Cathy Common Netherlands but mostly there for me it's important there it was also Prensela which is the association of the Dutch designers. So if you have the association of the Dutch designers, it will say, okay, now we could use open design that that say a lot. And if you want to see the book, it's more you say open design now is not because it's not really like the okay analyzing all the aspects, but it's more like a statement like we want open design now. So more like okay, you can see everything because you don't see everything about open design there, but it's very good as a statement like okay, we want open design now. This is possible. This is something that we could actually do. And when you really have this association behind it, it's like, okay, so it's, it's, back, it's getting better. It is sort of not accepted, but it's, it's getting attention. Yeah. It's still controversial. So, for example, I would say now a lot of even other companies, also another sign that these things are getting important, like Autodesk, are getting interested in this. You know, Autodesk is the software house behind AutoCAD also for the studio Maya well because they also been acquiring other companies and then this this year the, well the last year they started to be interested in this huge market of people working in DIY so they first acquired instructables and then they start releasing some software for free for helping you to design your own project and then share it online and they are basically now everything is for free because they are adopting the open source business model is selling services about that but they still don't want to release the software as open source you still they want to keep the IP about that. What will happen if they will release it? They don't want to do that. Yeah, but if they will? Well, the problem, the only thing is that most of this software, they work, I mean, the, some of the software will work on the cloud. So in any case, you have to build infrastructure for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not something that, well, you can, if you want to do in an easy way with Amazon EC, EC2 or other services, but it's not that easy that you really do like, like mm -hmm. this requires a lot of investment so also most of the software now is also moving to the cloud you see also the the new 3d modeling software like Tinkercad they're moving to the cloud so there's also a difference with open source software you own and you run on your computer so there also that that stuff okay yeah then well this is logical maybe is it, this is the next step I mean it's not like probably what we would like but it's what's happening so yeah. it's also important to see and on one side, they're also getting money, for example, you work with the software, then you want to output for 3D printing, they will already give you a link like, okay, do you want to 3D print with this service? So they will probably charge a free from this service. And also the same thing I think Arcad is doing. So in any case, it's charging from services around that. Yeah, but this, uh, 
I think that's uh, fair for them. Yeah, because in any case you have to pay for material exactly. and these services. So it shouldn't be like, you know, on someone's expense, but it should be no. self-sustaining. I mean, uh, there is also a huge ecosystem also for fabricating these things at your home or in a fab lab or in a space. So it's not the only entry point to this market. So it's not the only place. So they're charging me a lot because I only can print with this with them. So probably also that's the reason why they will not be too greedy. <laughs> if they release it as open source, in any case, well, they could just get improvement to the software. I would say because in any case, most of the software they so run on. Uh, they should, uh, they I would say probably yes, because mostly they run on Windows or Mac, but not all the software run on both platforms. Uh, there's nothing for Linux. Now they're moving all the things are web-based again, because everything is on the cloud more than your computer. So another way that is very good when you do release things as open source, you get a lot of people improving what you're doing. Is it always like that? I'm sure that if you get enough people working exactly. on that, if yes. They have a community around it. Exactly. But if they don't have a developer's community around them, then uh, they will be just uh, wasting their time and money putting it up. Well, I don't think it really costs a lot of money <laughs> on, put it on time on putting it online. Okay. Yeah, but you said uh, because they would have a problematic because of their own, they should put it because it's in the cloud. Or what problem did you No, no, it's not. Begin? No, the problem is like if you, it's open source, you can download, but then for running, then you have to put it on, on the cloud in oh, some okay. way or on your server. So they have to offer some kind of space for people who want to. They don't have to. It. They don't but have I mean, to. It's, it's up to you. Be, yeah, yeah, but otherwise, like, maybe people will be able to run with it. I would say people probably wouldn't be able to run. Somebody would try probably to have their own uh, cloud service to host them, but it's not. It requires a lot. Of exactly. So they like better have it. And it's a bit of money. Yeah, if they don't have a community, it will just not work. So they should be sure that it's uh, all there. I would say in any case, if you do something as open, if you don't have a community, it doesn't work. For, I mean, the first thing for making the success if you have a community around it. Because it would be something very clever, but if there is not interest, or if it's too difficult for people to understand that, then probably as open source, it doesn't work. Probably as proprietary, it works, but not as open source. And then the second level for measuring the success is how many people modify or build something on top of that. So for example, if you see all the different Arduino that's been done, people say, okay, there is this Arduino, yeah, but hey, I could buy the original one, not the created one. So for, it's also a way for having more marketing if you want. It's a good way for having more discussion than networking with okay, people. Okay, so being open is basically very good, but you should be professional about that. Very aware, like what you do and how you do. It. Otherwise, it won't work. It won't work as having a community around that, and it won't work for improving the code. But if you just want to share because you think that that's the most important thing, and then probably most of the activists and hackers will tell you, no, it's important just to share for the sake of sharing. Then probably you don't care about it. But that depend, depends really on your uh, idea. There have been studies in any case seeing how the old open source softwares and most of them are really small. But for example, you were uh, publishing your thesis online. So like, what kind of ideas you had behind it and what did you get as an outcome? Well, the idea was like, okay, yeah, I would like to see if this is meaningful or if it's just, you know, I to check it out. Ideas, to see if it's useful for somebody and see if somebody can improve that. Mm -hmm. uh, at least Two person, two people use that with, without even telling me that. They then discovered months later that they used that. Okay, well, I just just would like to know <laughs> what was the feedback, not just that. So yeah. What was the result? Well, it was very good for really networking and starting having more opportunities to work and working on that, because otherwise it would be okay. Waiting that somebody could get interested in this open thing and then. But wait, wait. Did you have a community? How did you release it? Well, I would say that it's very difficult that you start with a community. You start from the project and then you build the community. Okay. On one side, a lot of people become interested. Uh, the community is not big, it's not really active. So and you were just uh, sending out the links to this or you were publishing it to relevant resources? Or At the beginning, yes, we really like, I didn't want, to, I mean, I didn't have the money and the resources for doing, I mean, like, okay, now we go 
supposedly in the web and we run this as companies like okay I'm sharing it and networking with other people so it was really like okay let's see also what happens if people need photography. So you were spreading it from your own network basically? My network and the network have been built, yes. building around this. And this has worked really well. So the way for having discussion and networking with other people was work really well. Mm -hmm. So more than say, okay, that working on it specifically that. So probably, I don't know, in a few years we say, okay, this open design thing is not really useful, but mean, meanwhile, I've made a lot of friends. That's really nice. That's really worth doing all this and working on during night and all that. As a community, I would say it's slow, growing slowly. I would say that probably on, Probably for many people it's still too difficult, so probably that's why I say like probably it's not something at the moment that can be really used like in an easy way. But I'm I'm improving that, and also that's why I'm using workshops and other projects for improving and making it as easy as possible. Because in any case, for any open source project, whatever it is, I mean it's democratic in the sense that uh, anybody could potentially participate. The barriers are much lower, but in any case, you need a lot of knowledge, a lot. It depends on the project. But for example, if you want to modify Linux. Uh, we'll probably mostly want, need to speak English, need to be able to code, see, C++. We need to know all the softwares and the licenses, so I cannot do that. I cannot code in C++, sorry. So, I, okay, it's democratic, but I cannot work on that. It's yeah, pretty yeah. simple because I need that knowledge. So yeah. it's not that anybody can do whatever you want. I mean, I can send feedback, I can debugging a bit. That In that sense, I can participate. But it's not, I mean, I cannot fully participate on that. So, for example, if you make an open source community or something that, you know, only three person know that it's like, it's not easy that you will have a lot of people because it requires a lot of knowledge. For example, if you, when you work in a fab lab, uh, when you work in general with digital fabrication, you, uh, you know, people think that, okay, we'll just do the model and then push print or push, you know, cut and everything is ready. And actually it's not true because then you first have to design with the tech technology in mind. You have to know how the machine behaves and then mostly you will have to keep an eye on the process and especially then you will have to modify something and do some handwork. So it requires also a lot of knowledge. The good thing of this place is like public that you uh, learn a lot. So it's not a place like you know tech shop, you go there, you pay the, the money and somebody will help you for the money. And you go out, you have your object, but you have learned not a lot. If you go in these spaces, probably you pay less or you don't pay at all. You have to share with other people what you're doing, but you learn a lot and also that people learn a lot with you. So that's why really good. It's about building community, not about just the machine. Uh, it was very interesting when I was in three weeks ago in Manchester. Was the meeting of the European Fab Labs was introducing the Alto Fab Lab over there, and there is this man from the Netherlands, from Utrecht, Bart Bakker. He built a Fab Lab that, that fits into one, one room. So for 3,500 euro, you can have your own mini Fab Lab. So it's called Mini Fab Lab, mm -hmm. and he did a lot of research on building this to find the right technology. So. You know, I would expect him to say, you know, the important thing is the machine or these technologies, and he conclude like, you know, right, you know, guys. In the end, the most important thing is building a community around it. I'm really happy that a lot of children go in there. Mm. So that's the most important thing. So I would say that yeah, that, uh, using the machines is an excuse for building networks, for building social capital. So I would say, you know, for me, open design is an excuse for having more friends. That's the joke, but that that, that whole way it works. Little joke in every joke. So well, going back to the Mac community, and at the moment it requires a bit of knowledge. Uh, I'm trying to make it simpler, but then again, uh, I don't think that will probably be something completely huge, but really depends on many, many different. Yeah. Yeah, but I was just thinking from the point of view of the companies, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of resistance adopting, and. Uh, Open people think it's an evil resistance. <laughs> no, they just don't want to be open, proprietary. The company thinks that open is evil? Yes, well, they think it's evil and then uh, open people think that uh, companies are evil because they are proprietary. But uh, when we were talking now, I think we figured out that there might be a lot of things to it that they really just don't know how to use properly openness to, to benefit from it. Because in the end, it's uh, like, I mean, I, because for me, it's always uh, quite a bit of a problem to uh, attribute myself to the, the crowd of open people, because they're a little bit like uh, revolutionaries, like who want to break everything. Some of them, let's say. Yeah, uh, a, a, a lot of them. This, <laughs> yeah, and there is an image of these uh, people. And uh, my point of view is absolutely different. I think that open is 
very beneficial for everyone if you know how to use it. Exactly. And I see that the, this um, misunderstanding very, mm. very disturbing because on the, there are like some I don't know, there's like some classical people on one side that say there's proprietary people who are like this old school of no, we're going to do it this way and some bunch of revolutionaries on the other side and they're never going to agree unless there will be like some some people who build the connections between and I see this is the main like uh, task for people who are doing uh, openness not for like hanging out together and breaking up some rules but for actually benefiting everyone and those proprietary guys as well and um, as we were talking about Amazon it's just maybe that they really like there are many like little things or in the big things that they don't know and they it's safer to stay well, with, with, uh, in, the, in the area where they're familiar with everything with all the methods and all the things that they should do and that's I see the, the main task for like, open data enthusiasts, like, open design or anyone who's talking about openness to talk about it, but it's actually a connector, not break breaking up with that. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you on that. Actually, what, what I'm trying also to bridge this, mm -hmm. and I would say that probably my, my target is much more people that don't know about openness than the, the activists. It's like, uh, I don't have to talk with some artists, you know, about openness and sure, they already do that. Exactly. The only thing they will probably they say, you know, this license is not as open as you would, uh, you should use the other one because it's much more open. Yeah. Which is, which is very boring <laughs> discussion. Mm -hmm. But it's much more interesting to uh, uh, explain to the people how to do, use that. And mostly it's really about, okay, I don't want to care about that. And for, I don't know, for some people, for example, it's very exciting and it's very useful for them to say, you know, we are breaking everything with this. We're going to change everything and we, you're going to lose your job because then we are... Ch but, okay, prove it. Do it. Try to do it if you can. I don't think that you, you will really do that. It's not, this is not what's happening. What's instructive to, to check with the revolutionaries also is to really ask them where they make their livelihood. Because sometimes I've met people who actually have a full-time job somewhere and then what they do is they divert their frustration from working in this unmeaningful mm, yeah, job exactly. by like pushing some other agenda. So they have, you know, needed to compromise themselves by, you know, over promoting maybe a certain value system. For many people, you know, promoting yourself by revolutionary for your personal brand is very good. Yeah. Because you are listening more if I talk yeah, you know, I talk about the, also the weak side of openness, not just the good side. Mm. And then of course, no, this is yeah. less inspiring, this is less interesting. Let's mm -hmm. have some revolutionary. This is very good for the personal branding, but then when you talk, with, when you're going to talk with some people about open design, it's like, oh yeah, this is the thing, you know, that everybody's a designer, so we are not designer, and everything is going to be terrible things, and blah, 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 this is going to ruin everything, and you want to be just destroyed. I think, no, actually, it's not that. And I don't want to ride in that airplane that, you know, everybody designs, and I mean, it's very interesting, for example, the, the biography of Linus Torvalds, that at least the, the Italian installation was like, you know, uh, revolutionary by accident. Okay, yeah. I mean, I would say that you start really small and then you see if, it, if it's interesting, it really has an impact. Mm -hmm. Then you say, okay, this is actually doing... Because it's very good that this openness has spread to many, many different things. But uh, I don't think it's really enough most of the time. You really have to see, okay, does it mean something and especially what's the difference between the software and then what we are talking because if you're working I don't know with design or hardware it's very different thing so you cannot use the same thing that you use software not just because okay the license doesn't apply but also what does it mean to talk about the source with key code here and there and all dynamics and the business model so it's not the same thing applying going there it's like everything is open source and everything has to be open source no it's just finding the right place I guess that I think that's uh, it's all about the balance. That now uh, proprietaries, I don't know, maybe 95 percent and five open. We don't say that it should be 90 because what revolutionaries imply that we have to be 95 open. No, we just have to be maybe 50, 50, maybe even like uh, yep. 75, 25. But uh, of course, we like what we notice now that there is not enough of openness to uh, to benefit. It because it's like it's too close at the moment. That's why we need some shift in it. But it shouldn't be hundred percent. Uh, that's that's very important to yeah. <laughs> to communicate and this idea. And then, for example, you see, especially when talking about open design or hardware or physical things, is that you're like, okay, 
gets broken, so I can repair it because it's open. I have access to documentation. Yeah. But that's only for some. Pro I mean, probably most or a huge percentage of the products you buy. You know, you cannot access them, especially you know, I don't know, Mac products are infamous now because you need a specific key to unscrew them and open. And the last Mac that's been published, promoted out with the Retina display, is basically impossible to fix. News, news of the day is that is that one. So for a lot of projects, yes, it's that, and it's also it's planned obsolescence. Uh, but this is not something that necessarily is solved sol with openness. I mean, even if you combine companies to get rid of these stupid things of so planned obsolescence, then okay, that's very good. So I guess sometimes yes, it makes sense that you well, you should be able in any case always to repair something. You know, but it's not necessarily it has to be open because you can also modify something that's existing. I mean, I don't need to have the blueprint of this. I can modify it. So it's not opaque as in software when you have the source code that's human readable, the binary code that only the machine can read. And if I give you the binary code, you don't understand anything. I mean, if I give you this, we can 3D scan, we can draw it down, we can take measurement and so on, and then we can read modify it. So that's very good for example for what's going on with open source cars. Of course, car design, or everybody loves it, so it's one, there are a lot of uh, examples about that. And they mostly failed. They mostly have failed. Because they said, okay, we'll design a car from scratch, it will be completely open. But the problem is that if you want to build a car, you need a lot of knowledge, you need a lot of financial resource, material resource, you, you need a huge supply chain that you don't start from scratch. So the few projects that have been very successful, they started their own supply chain, like local motors, they, invent, they invested more on the supply chain than just starting there. Or it was e-cars e now from Finland. What they do was really clever. They, just, they didn't say, okay, we just have the open source car. We uh, produce basically the toolkit, the information for modifying an existing car, and it's like, look at, okay, what's the most sold car in the, in the world? Okay, it's Toyota Corolla, so we, we address this car. Mm -hmm. And we publish the information for modifying the car and make it as an electric car. So in any case, I mean, it's much more uh, relevant to the world, it's much more sustainable. But what is open source is only a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really a clever move for hacking something instead of saying no. You have to, you have to be completely open, otherwise it's not good. Because somewhere in time and place, and for some people, this link has been lost. Like, you know, like, okay, open source is good. This is the way for solving problems. Like, you know, anything that's open is absolutely necessarily good. Mm -hmm. exactly. And there are also dark side if you want. For example, some years ago, already some few, like seven years ago, or eight years ago, the, the Texas state put a lot of webcam on the border and then put all the webcam online and it was called uh, Texas Border Watch and then any citizens, citizens could go online and watch what's going on the border if there were some terrible and dirty Mexican crossing the border <laughs> could click go and fetch them and it was open you mm -hmm. were participating mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's really also okay wh what are we we doing you know on this on this level yeah, yeah, yeah. and then sometimes there is uh, not a discussion a lot on the value so again for the car for example okay we're doing the car that's more sustainable but if you talk to the people doing research on sustainability and cars, so they talk about mobility solutions, not car. Yeah. So why should we do really do a car, which we already know that is something that's old, that's unsustainable. So that part is a bit a bit lost sometimes. Can I just say something? This is the first green drinks ever where everyone has a notebook and writing notes. So excellent for learning. And it's only the third green drinks ever where a lot of people are. any other questions <laughs> but this idea of starting with the question is much more interesting than having the formal presentation and yeah yeah oh yeah okay. <laughs> but it's because the i mean i don't order those expensive mckinsey reports but i get those emails all the time about mckinsey reports and they're always i mean there's always something about openness so i think there must be a huge amount of research on exactly that what is the business strategy? What to keep open? What to keep closed? Yes, uh, well, I can tell for the via medical industry because I've been involved in it lately, and uh, there there is a lot of interest, like uh, in uh, building these kind of systems. And uh, well, there is more interest in estimating what is the cost and how they operate. Like what it because, but it's something no risk management. Mm, mm, well. Yeah, not particularly something like risk management, but just like how it all works. 
blueprints. Okay, if yeah. someone can, can just uh, write it down, make a service blueprint for it, calculate according to this blueprint, like how much people are going to spend, like human hours, like, uh, man hours. This yeah, will be okay, like, yeah, yeah, everyone yeah, 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 yeah. is ready to pay millions for that, you know, like an yeah. environmental science in uh, like the, this uh, medi medical, like, like what, what is this there? Like, like uh, people who deal with the gene information, like uh, yeah. genes, uh, sequences, they are all very extremely interested because what they are facing now, that they are they have to build uh, to do something that makes sense to develop further the, this science, and it's already been like I think it's maybe most of, one of the most developed sciences because health is the first thing people care about, and. Uh, they, they really reach the point when they only can build something in a huge resource, multidisciplinary, very like uh, different people from very, very different areas, uh, like, and very, very big. Like It can be 30 organizations, and many people in each organization involved, so it's like a, quite a big community already. Yep. And uh, managing these communities and making them like into this self-organizing system that produces something and more importantly, sustains the results of its collaboration is a very, very hot now. Yeah, and this is uh, still not solved because there are there are different kind of uh, solutions for that, uh, and uh, some and they work at some extent, but not still solving. And uh, this open, like the ideas of openness, are like they have a chance to. Organize other, like uh, other, like um, things around it in a, in such fashion that it actually will work. Yeah. Because but if you believe that this is really going to be the next paradigm, I mean, after the industrial paradigm, and industrial production, and consumption, <laughs> it's going to take decades. Yeah, it you know, will. Just but, but but they have to think fast because they really like. I mean, they do have problems. Uh, and especially it's funny to see in the pharmaceutical industry because um, uh, they, they already don't have so many uh, drugs and pipelines that they're really like exhausting their resources but what they do they just strengthen the control now yeah, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. which is funny because it's uh, it's the opposite what they what they need to do and I, I think we are very close to the moment where this uh, control party is going to collapse yeah yeah because they just said, like, the more control they impose, the the less like innovation they will get out. But there's a project. What's it called? It's it's something like self. It's not self pharma. I'm making that up, but it's really something like that. Money sticker was talking about. What's the name of the project? That's what I'm trying to remember. I'm just pretending that it's called self pharma, but it's really something like that. It's an open mm. sharing project for. People to be able to go down their own processing process. Okay. Folder Macmillan? I didn't hear you. Folder Macmillan? Well, but that, that was different. You were just offering part of your processing power to uh, the development of the chemical uh, substances. I have to check what it was called. Well, there is a huge movement of DIY bio, DIY biotechnology. Yeah. So it's probably one of these. Yeah, well, it's generally it's called DIY bio. So it's like okay, all the people that are trying to uh, all wetware, you know, people that are trying to work with uh, medicines or biological organisms uh, in their garage. So there is also, for example, one open hardware device based on Arduino that helps you in the process of sequencing DNA. Okay. It doesn't do all the stuff, but in one of the processes, it helps you do that. Okay. Then, of course. It's, it's a bit more problematic because you need specific instruments for doing this kind of operation at home. So it's still a bit behind that, but it's, it's really growing a lot as a, as a movement. Yeah, and it's, it's very important so that the farmer is aware of what's happening and they actually just get involved in the movement, not just crossing themselves over. Well, farmers are already using these people to think about the incentives. They have this growth sourcing of competition challenges. Like, okay, we need a new chemical for doing something. Mm. And usually, when well, people are told, it's usually, they, of course, they have knowledge about these things. They develop new yeah. substances and then mm. they send them to the mm. send Yeah, but these kind of things are not going to be enough. They're going to build like, something very big otherwise. And, uh, yeah. mm.
and in the end we didn't touch a lot of the issue of sustainability. I think it was always popping up there though, I mean especially even just this community. One, one thing more about sustainability, especially environmental sustainability, uh, is like that will say that this is not really addressed a lot in openness generally. Because there is the okay, it's much more sustainable if I can repair it, so I won't need to buy something else, you know, another copy. That's okay, but it's not enough, I will say. And it's not really, there is nothing about that built into the, the philosophy of open source but software and also in the moment about open design. And I will give you an example. I thought at the beginning it was happening only in Italy, but then I discovered it was open up, up, happening in Europe, and also you say that people started to steal copper, cable copper, from the train cables and then sometimes some people die because of that because they have high voltage and that is good for example in the Netherlands was a huge train accident because the people <laughs> stole 100 meters of uh, copper cable and then you say yeah of course these are desperate people but you know if you really see what's happening with the, with the materials and the oil and all this everything is picking oil is picking metals are picking in Malaysia even wood is picking and it's something that's renewable but we are you know, using that much the wood we are tearing down all the forest that is becoming you know after the peak so if already people are still in copper you, you cannot think that you know everybody will have its own huge company about open hardware and you're going to produce you know millions of components and so on there is something that still has to be addressed and thought about that yeah. and again for example you say okay if this is much more sustainable because i can print you know, I don't know let's say a chair at home and add on that to the shop and to take the chair, the chair from the shop and the chair will come from China, yes, but the plastic that you're using for 3D printing, where is coming from? But at the moment, mostly it's coming from China, well, yeah. the United States, yeah. and we don't know where it's coming from yeah. over there. Some plastic are bio-based, so based on cellulose, so they're supposed to be, at least they're biodegradable. They can reuse or compost the ground with that, but you know, the more you use the energy, the more there is energy. So that's very important to understand this. And this is probably even more controversial than sharing the IP. Yeah. So the, but there's something that mm, very soon probably will have to be addressed if you think about these things. So I think it's very important to understand you know, how to redesign all the system around the production. Not just, okay, I'm printing it, I'm sharing, so it's much more sustainable because of that. Yeah, it's just the method, you know, like the ideology. There is a uh, very interesting book, which unfortunately I only read about part, but very briefly, but very interesting, was Planet of Slums, written by Mike Davis, which usually write books about cities. And in that book it was uh, uh, talking about you know, Bidonville, uh, favelas, slums, generally. And in the end the conclusion was like, you know, you know these are the places that at the moment are really sustainable. Because they are able to go on and uh, live with very little. So if there is a collapse in energy, in other sources, we will probably will be uh, you know us in the rich country in the rich cities in the rich part of the, s the city that will have problems they already know how to live with very little yeah, yeah. or the villages so it's also very interesting to, to to understand it's not just okay we're going to this development country and being this our knowledge because it's just the way to do the thing they should be also learning from that yeah, from exactly. peer-to-peer exactly. level yeah, yeah. which is very very critical mm -hmm. also because we have very specific also culture of reducing diversity this very really good book by Vandana Shiva called Monoculture of the Mind is basically about okay biotechnology and biodiversity and the IP protection of that. But what's really important about uh, the whole book is not about okay agriculture, but they say like okay if we go and we build we bring monocultures you know to one land, we're basically also raising the culture that's there. Because usually because you have different also vegetables growing at the same time, they're reinforcing, they have different use for the local uh, people. And actually we are going there, we are releasing all of this by bringing only one idea, just this crop. And it was very good that it's like, okay, this is more about, you know, the culture and the understanding that the, also the local knowledge, which is probably, you know, on some level it's not refined as us, with other level it's much more refined. 
and it has developed through years and centuries, so there's a reason why they're, crop, they're harvesting this crop and not another one. So there must probably much more to, to learn from this country about this than just our approach. Okay, let's have tabula rasa, blank canvas, and start from scratch. Yeah, I'm writing down the master <laughs> knowledge transfers. Done. There's also the same problem that uh, knowledge transfers, whatever technological they are always done one way, and they even don't use the possibility to learn like what is the learning style of this particular culture, where they transfer it. Yeah, and yeah. they were just pushing it uh, the way they they have it. Uh, Original country, and that was unsuitable. There was a lot of um, uh, problems to absorbing this knowledge. There were also a lot of conflict and uh, problems. Yeah. Is it just me, or are there some very weird sounds? Yeah. <laughs> All the way. <laughs> All the way. I need to go to the sun now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, run, run, run home quickly. Yeah, it was very optimistic. Oh, yeah, it's summer. There's a lot of sun and then... <laughs> yeah. Also take tea for the...